Good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Little. I'm the trainer for a company called Greenbird Actual. I'll be doing classes Saturday and Sunday. They asked me to come out and do like a really brief Q&A with you guys. It's not so much a demo as it is just kind of talking about training and maybe showing some things if you have any questions. And unless somebody else has a question they really want to ask, I figured I'd talk about how I classify training drills. I think that's really important. So everybody good for that? You good with that? All right. So kind of my background is I did well over 20 years in the Army. Um, began in active duty and then I was in 20th Special Forces Group, which is a part-time SF unit. And I also did 21 years with Chicago PD. I wrapped up there as the training coordinator for the SWAT team. Towards the very end of my career, I finally started listening to people who've been telling me for decades that I should compete and realized that I didn't know anywhere near as much as I thought I knew about shooting. So well over two decades of shooting at what I thought was a very high level, and I had more to learn than I ever thought I would have had to learn when I started competition. And I think there's a couple of key factors to that, right? One is that competition shows you how good good really is. You know, when you show up to a match, like most of us like look on YouTube and we see the world of national champions. We know how good Ben Steger and Bob Vogel and all those guys are. What we don't realize is when we show up to the local match, how good the IT guy and the construction worker are, right? So I showed up to my first USPSA match as a 20 year Green Beret and like a 15 year SWAT guy and got my lunch money taken by an IT guy who'd never carried a gun for a living, right? So I had two choices then. I could either just kind of go back and say, well, that's, that's just competition and that'll get you killed in the street and just shore up my ego. Or I could figure out why these guys could shoot rings around me after everything I'd done in my life. So I figured I'd go ahead and put on my big boy pants and take option number B, right? Competitors train like athletes. And for all that we throw out the phrase tactical athlete all the time, institutionally, as organizations, we very seldom actually train like athletes. And really, an SFODA or a SWAT team is a basically a professional sports team with the world's highest stakes, right? Everybody here who's on a SWAT team, you are a professional athlete. You are getting paid by your department for your athletic skill. And I personally think we should train like athletes. And that's not just shooting, that's CQB, that's everything across the board, right? So I had a very painful couple of years where I lost matches trying to figure out how to make myself better because I had to undo decades of habits that I had before. I made master class in USPSA in just a few months because of everything I'd done before and then promptly got stuck there and couldn't win master class at a match because I had to figure out what I was doing wrong, right? And that's kind of a long-winded explanation for how I came up with my training philosophy which is really what my classes are about. They're not about the individual skill and technique of shooting per se. They're about how to train yourself after the class so that you keep getting better in the years to come. So that you can max out your skill level in five to six years instead of spending decades on it like I did and not even being close, right? And I think there's some common mistakes we make in our shooting training. And one of those is the way we structure our drills. So when you guys go to the range as individuals or as a team, do you have like a comprehensive plan for how your drills are going to work together over your training cycle like a power lifter or an Olympic lifter does or somebody who performs in the NFL or some other high level of sports? Or just kind of go out there and go, hey, this was a cool drill on YouTube, I'm going to shoot this, right? That's what we typically do, it's what I did too. You've got to break these things up and kind of the framework I came up with was I classify drills as experimentation work, isolation work, combination work, and then testing. And I think all of those are really, really important to your training, especially if you have to be your own coach, which most of us really have to be, right? Typically, as cops or military, we do a lot of isolation work and we do a lot of testing and wonder why we can't perform in the test the same way we perform in isolation. Like, well shit, I did two reload two in 2.25, but when I go up there and I have something like this with a reload in it, my reload's taking me almost two seconds. Why is that? It's because when you combine skills under stress, your performance on the individual skill degrades. So you have to, act, you have to actually train that, right? You have to actually train how to combine things under stress. That's what led to the combination drills. Experimentation drills, this was a really hard pill for me to swallow. 
because all of us typically take as dogma what we're taught, right? There's a quote, the guy who wrote uh, Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal, the opening line of the book Hannibal is, technique is the religion of the dangerous trades, right? That means we look at technique as what will get us through the bad day. And that is correct. The problem is the technique has to be optimized for you. And the example I always use for this is grip, right? I am basically the missing link. I am built like an orangutan. My thumbs don't oppose and my hands are like flippers. I could swim through air, right? Where's my Burger King commercial hands guy? There's always one here. Who's got tiny hands? Uh, I see you trying to hide. So, yep. <laughs> my grip is not going to look like his grip, right? When you watch those YouTube videos of the top shooters, Robert Vogel's grip looks nothing like Ben Stager's grip because their physical structure and attributes are different and their psychology is different. But both of their grips accomplish the same thing, which is a mitigate recoil and return the gun to the initial point of aim consistently, reliably, rapidly under stress, right? You have to figure out how your technique is going to work for you. Who here watches MMA? All right. I expected more hands because, you know, we're all heterosexual males here, but that's okay. <laughs> all right, so your top fighters, does everybody's technique look exactly the same? Not even close, right? They've optimized the principles of those techniques for themselves. I was always afraid to experiment because I thought it would slow down my progress. And then once I realized how important it was and started to put it into my training, it didn't slow it down at all. It accelerated it because I was able to figure out how the technique works for me. What makes it good for me? Everybody understand? So don't be afraid to do the experimentation drills. That's where you figure out your technique. Then you have the isolation drills, which is what we all do already, right? That's where you sharpen and polish the technique you figured out. You make it as fast and accurate as possible, right? But then how do we make it reliable and consistent and dependable under stress? We have to learn to string more and more tasks together in combination. Because you have to have subconscious competence. So when you guys are in the shoot house, if you're thinking consciously about the shooting, can you really do CQB right? No. Your shooting has to run like a program in your subconscious, right? Like a, like a background program on your computer. You know when you open up your computer, there's programs that run just in the background that you don't look at? It's gotta be like that. And your conscious mind has to be aware of the tactical situation, what's going on, and make those big picture decisions while your subconscious handles the shooting and where your feet go and all those things. The way to develop that skill is by working skills in combination in your training, giving yourself more and more random complexity under stress so that your brain can figure out that attribute, the way to do that. Am I making sense? When you do that, the things you're trying to do is you're trying to be able to develop more and more complexity before it falls apart. You're trying to lower the gap between your PR, your personal best performance on a skill in isolation, and how well you perform when you combine that with other tasks under stress. You'll never make it touch, but you can narrow that gap closer and closer the more you train like this. If you watch the way top USPSA competitors train, they spend about half their time setting up random little courses of fire and doing them three to five times so they don't groove in the pattern. That's what they're doing. They're building that ability to combine skills without it degrading, right? Then you have the last thing, you have the test. The test exists, well, the test may be life or death, but that's a different story. In your training, you need to test yourself on a regular basis. The test is what gives you the feedback loop to go back to the beginning of that cycle. And if you need to experiment, if not, go ahead and isolate things to make them better. Then combine them and then test again. Everybody understand? It looks a lot like the way athletes train because shooting, despite what we want to tell ourselves, is very much an athletic skill. So for some reason, we think the rules of athletic performance go out the window when we put a gun in our hands, and that couldn't be furthest from the truth. A good example of that is I had this really solid kid on my SWAT team that we brought on that had been in the NFL for a brief amount of time before becoming a cop. Phenomenal athlete, right? But in the beginning, you put a gun in his hand, he did not look like the coordinated professional athlete he was. 
We've got to train that out. How many times have you seen somebody who's a phenomenal athlete do the SWAT run, where they run from place to place looking at their feet with their gun down, right? You have to train those things out. So this is a real quick down and dirty of what my class is about this weekend. It's how to construct your training, how to template it, how to do the feedback loop, how to collect the data, how to self-coach so that you can reach your potential as a shooter as rapidly as possible. So now I'm gonna turn the floor over to you guys and if you guys have any questions or you want me to elaborate on any of this, how much time do I have left? One minute. One minute. Really? We can answer questions off to the side. Okay. All right. So we've got pretty much done. All right. All right, guys. This was a real quick down and dirty. I hope some of you are in my class so I can get into it more. I hope you did enjoy this, at least the concepts of it. And if you have any questions, I'll be over there hanging out in the back of that tailgate. Matt Little, everybody. Gray beard, actual. One of our uh, top instructors here at TTPOA. You'll see him around this weekend. Thank you so much. Stay tuned in.